chapter 1. We're going to be picking it up in verse 5. So let's pray and ask God to bless this time as we uh, dig into his word. Our great God and our Father, we praise you and thank you. We praise you and thank you because when all else fails, we can trust you. And we can trust your word and we ask, Lord, that you would illuminate it into our hearts and our minds. That, Lord, you would speak to us truth. Lord, pour out your spirit in a beautiful way. Give us the gift of teaching. We need it. Touch us by your Holy Spirit, O God. And Lord, we want to thank you because truly we can trust the one who died for us. So help us, Lord, not to focus in on the craziness of the world, but to focus in on the cross, to focus in on our great God and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. So bless now, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. And if you agree with that church, you'll say... Amen. Hey, before I get into the study, and I, I do have it here, but I, I asked people to do homework last week. Does anybody remember? Chris did his homework. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you to come on out, come on up, and, and we're going to see what happened when you did your homework. Does anybody remember what the homework was? It was to get a jar of dirt and then shake it up and leave it and see what came out of it, like maybe a watch. So that's what he did. So now we're going to see exactly what happens when you take dirt, shake it up, press down, all that stuff. It even popped when I opened it. It popped when you opened Wow, there might be something alive in there. It's dirt and dust. <coughs> that's you. And there's sticks. Yeah. So, you know, and I'm sure there's microorganisms in here. Because one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, and I'll get into in a second, is the same elements that are in this pan that were in that jar are in you. The same exact 17 elements that are there are sitting right where you're sitting. Yeah, you're all a bunch of dirt clods. So you can, you can take that home and you can, you can put it on the shelf and come back in a month and we'll see if anything comes out of it. But I'm pretty much guessing nothing will. But, he, you know, and that was a you know, good job. You get a, a star. <laughs> you did your homework. But some of the greatest achievements of mankind, you know, when you think about great achievements of mankind, you know, obviously number one would have to be walking on the moon. That was a great achievement. How about harnessing electricity? You can't say electricity because God created electricity, but to harness electricity, that was a great achievement. All the many medical advancements that have been made over the last few hundred years, that is incredible. The internet, I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, it depends on what side of the screen you're on, and for some of us, it's not good. But did you know that in these great achievements, from the start of the space program to Neil Armstrong rock walking on the moon, it took 4,009 days. 4,009, it didn't happen overnight. The first workable prototype of the internet came in the late 1960s. And then with the creation of ARPNET, or the Advanced Research Project Agency Network, that's what began the internet. Some of you are going, I knew that. I didn't know that. That shows you I don't have a life because I'm looking this stuff up. But it wasn't until ARPNET adopted TCP IP, which happened on January 1st, 1983. Who knows what TCP is? What about IP? Internet protocol, exactly. And once they integrated that, they were able to assemble the networks of networks that became the modern internet. That was 1983. The first light bulb, does anybody know when the first light bulb was invented? Anyone? It wasn't Edison who did it. The first light bulb was produced, invented in 1802. It wasn't until 77 years later, October 1879, that Thomas Edison produced the first commercial light bulb. 
Now, here's the whole reason, the whole point of this. God created the heavens and the earth and all the life forms in six days. But that isn't God's greatest miracle. God's greatest miracle, in, in my opinion, is salvation. The regeneration of a human life, which is accomplished, and I don't know if you knew this, it was accomplished before he did anything else. Before creation, salvation was accomplished. That can't be right. Oh, it really is. It's Revelation 13, 8. Listen to what we read. We are clearly told that Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, was slain, which could be translated before the foundations of the world. He was slain before the foundations of the world. In other words, that means before anything was ever created, God was thinking about you. He knew you. He loved you. He had great plans and purposes for your life. He knew you before the world were, which means everything God created. And please check this out. It's important for you to let this sink into your heart. Everything God created was for you. Personally, I think that's totally wicked, awesome, cool. That all this he created for us. And as we go through Genesis, the creation account, and all the genealogies, and through the whole Bible itself, I think it's important that we remember God had you in mind. So with your Bibles open to chapter 1, we got as far as verse 5, but let's go back to Genesis 1.1 1, 1, just to get some context before we get into verse 6. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. So God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. This is the origins. This is the beginning of time, space, matter. What God did is he created the first nuclear forces, and creating the heavens and the earth. That's what he did, the first nuclear forces. Then we're told that the Spirit of God created the gravitational forces to make the earth spherical. And God the Son, in my opinion, created the electromagnetic forces so that there was light. And we see this trinity throughout the creation account. A, a create a trinity of forces by a trinity that's one God. And, and these three forces govern the entire universe. The entire universe is governed by these three things. Once time is introduced, Time itself has its own trinity. You have a past, a present, and a future. See, before there was time, there was no time. God's in eternity. So before in the beginning, there was no past, no present, no future. Now, of course, when it comes to the heavens, we see, again, a trinity because you have your atmosphere, you have the stars where the planets and everything are, the galaxies, and then, of course, you have the third heaven, which is where God's throne is. And finally, you have the earth. And again, you have a trinity because you have solids, liquids, and gas all working together interdependent upon each other. There's another book, I recommended a bunch of books last week. There's another book I recommend for those of you who are kind of weird like me. Um, it's Ivan Panan's, and it, there it is. Um, it's Numerics and Scriptures, How Mathematic Proves the Holy Scriptures. 
One of the things you need to remember in both the Hebrew and Greek language, they all have numeric values. So every word has a value to it. Every letter has a value to it. Now, there are those who take the numerology and the numerics to the far end of the world. And can anybody say Kabbalah and stuff like that? And it's just weird. It's mysticism. And it's just wrong. But Panan spent 50 plus years compiling over 43,000 pages of notes. He, by the way, he took it to um, the people where you get Nobel Prizes presented it to them and said, this is why I believe the Bible is true. And they said to him, we can find no fault in your work. And he looked at the numerical structures of the Bible each book of the Bible, beginning with Genesis, had a numerical value. And that was important because if you were a scribe, you would add up all the letters at the end with a numeric value. And if you didn't get the key, you knew you messed up somewhere and you had to start over. So it would help the scribes. So here, if you look at just the hepatic structure, and hepatic is number seven, and that means any words and sentences divisible by seven. And I'm not going to give you all the details. You can read it for your own. But just in Genesis 1.1, there are over 11 features of numeric divisions of seven that when you calculate it out, the chances of that are 33 trillion to one. Does anybody know anything about probabilities? <laughs> 33 trillion to one, based on his calculations, that the science community could find no fault with. Now, I want an evolutionist to produce anything regarding intelligent design that has that kind of degree of accuracy. They can't. They can't. See, those numeric patterns, they run through the entire Bible. So you can actually, he has a series of books on this, and it's mind-numbing. And I just think, wow, he spent over 50 years doing this. I can fall asleep after five minutes. But it shows that God's word is true and sure. Now, the second day, check it out, verse 6. Then God said, let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and it's literally, it's a, it's a, a plural word here in the original language, so God called the firmament heavens. And so the evening and the morning were the second day. I love this because... One of the things I want you to notice that God said and the elements obeyed. See, he said, hey, divide it up. And it was so. Boy, I wish I was more obedient like that. You know what I mean? God said, and I said, OK. Now, of all the days of the creation, the second day is the most difficult of the six because of the language there. That word feminine, it's raka. And it literally means flat expanse, an extended surface. The, the Hebrew means a beaten out dome. So like if you had a metal shop, you would beat out something and, and make it into a big dome. And between that expanse, we're told that God divides two bodies of water. One that's below and one that's above that expanse. In Psalm 148, verse 4, we read this. Praise him, you heavens and earth, and you waters above the heavens. And you think, oh. But you have to understand, this was written a thousand, well, actually, probably close to 4,000 years after the creation expense. Uh, 2,500 years, 2,500 years after what we're reading here. 
well, well, well after Noah's flood. So is this looking back and simply telling us what happened? Or is it simply telling us that our atmosphere is essentially made up of water, water vapor and, and all this other stuff, which is true. See, even though today our atmosphere is made up of water and water vapor and all these elements, it's not to the degree it was in Genesis 1.6. And I believe this is describing what you've probably heard is a canopy of water, a vapor canopy, which protected the earth until Noah's flood. Because it clearly says there was a division of waters below and waters above. Now we know, if the Bible's true, and I believe we can prove it to be true numerically in other ways, that until Noah's flood, there was no rain. There was no rain. There was a vapor or a mist, the Bible tells us, that rose from the earth every day and watered the ground. That the vapor canopy protected the earth and made it literally into a Big tropical island. The entire earth would have been tropical. Well, well, wait a minute. How can that be true? Well, science proves it. How does science prove it? Well, did you know they've discovered in the North Pole and Antarctica tropical vegetation? Fern asparagus 50 feet big. Scientists have found woolly mammoths. Now, woolly mammoth would have been around long time ago, according to these scientists, they found them in Antarctica, which is below, and North America, which is above. Now, it's not that they found them there, it's what they found in them, because they discovered unchewed tropic vegetation in their mouths and in their stomach, undigested, frozen stiff, like they were just eating. You know, I, I, you read this stuff and it immediately, did anybody ever see Despicable Me? Yeah. Freeze gun. <laughs> and that's literally what, what, what it like happened. And that's what happened with the flood. So before the flood, the whole world had a uniform environment. It was tropic. It was protected from all the harmful gamma, infrared and ultraviolet radiation. And that would allow both animals and humans to live longer and be both bigger and taller. And again, the fossil records bear that out. So here God spreads out the heavens. And I like this. God spreads it out. He puts it out. And he's setting a foundation for life. He's laying the foundation of all the galaxies and everything. In verse 9, we read this. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, literally into a single basin or a bed, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. You know, there was someone else who commanded the, the seas, and that was Jesus. He said, peace, be still. And they were. Now, for the land to appear, God had to gather all the waters that covered the earth. And so the whole earth was covered in water at this point into one place. And, and that, there are a hundred different opinions, maybe even more. And since no one was here, we really don't know what that looked like. But I believe, and it's my opinion, that there was a single land mass at this point, not a bunch of continents. The continents didn't come until in Genesis 10, 25, the days of peg leg, where we read, to ever were born two sons. The name of one was peg leg, for in his days the earth was divided. So there's one land mass. 
And it's divided at that point into many continents. And of course, you've read about continental drift and all this other stuff. But before the flood, all of the water was gathered into a single body, a single place, both below and above. And what God is doing is he's coalescing the elements into granite, stone, soil, and sand. He made land mass. In verse 10, he says, And God called the dry land earth, and gathered together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Again, we don't know what it was like before the flood, but we know that right now on this planet, there are 330. 30 cubical million miles of water on the face of the earth. That's a lot of water. We know that every day on this planet, 1.5 trillion gallons of rain fall every single day on this planet, just not in Arizona. <laughs> there are some rain forces where they get over 200 inches a year of rainfall. That's like, I don't want that, but I'd like a little more than we get. We know that our atmosphere is made up of 79% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and 1% variant gases. And, and you need that for water to be water. You can't have water with anything different. In fact, if the atmosphere was 50% nitrogen and 50% oxygen, the first person who lit a cigarette and you'd have the biggest bang of your life, boom, it'd all be gone. The evolutionist says it was all from a bunch of, or random and chance events. Now, I call random or chance events mistakes. And God didn't do that. God knew exactly what he was doing. He was making an integrated system for mankind. The human body or the human blood, the human body 70% water and your blood is 90% water. Did you know that? 90% water. There's a great movie to rent or buy or both. It's called The Privileged Planet. There it is. This is a bunch of scientists that tackle all these subjects way better than me. So, you know, you should get it, watch it. You know, it's, 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 they're really good. And, and all anyone can clearly, certainly say for certain is that there's one planet in the entire known galaxies, one planet and one planet alone that is able to sustain life, and that's Earth. That's Earth. There is no other. They can keep looking all they want, and this is the one that God said for us. Well, back to the third day in verse 11. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed and fruit trees that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. See, God in his wisdom causes the earth to bring forth. And literally, to bring forth in the Hebrew means to sprout. So again, all this stuff is sprouting up. And, and, and again, this is all kinds of grass, all kinds of bushes, all kinds of edible plants and fruit according to its kind. And you're going to see that phrase over and over and over again, according to its kind, according to its kind. You know, there, at this point, we know there's one kind of grass. And now how many different kinds of grass are they? There's a ton of them, but they're all grass. You know, you can, you can take berries. In fact, the boysenberry, I'm trying to remember if this, the boysenberry was a raspberry and a blueberry that they combined and ended up with a boysenberry. But it's still a berry. What I want to see is when somebody plants an apple seed and they get a banana, then you got something there. 
So, and, and, and when it comes to apples, how many different kinds of apples? I, I went to the store to get some for, for the young adults. We were going to do um, apples and caramel and all that. And there were literally 13 different kinds of apples in the store. And I'm going, what's the difference? They're still apples, though. It's like the only difference I saw was that one was green and these ones weren't. It's like, so, it, you know, I'm, I'm just the thing is, is evolution tells us something completely different. In verse 12, he says, and the earth brought forth grass and herb that yields seed according to its kind and the trees that yield fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the third day. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, yeah, that's what we say. But if you talk to an evolutionist, they say the egg. And God tells us right here, the chicken came first. Why? Because did you see what it says? The seed is in itself according to its kind. That's called a mature tree, a mature fruit, a mature vegetable. It's mature. And over and over again, you see that phrase over and over again. Now, remember, in the first verses, we saw God create, and that word was bara, something from nothing. We don't see that word in here at all. We see, don't see that again until verse 21. So what God is doing is he's forming. He's taking the known elements and forming everything on the earth. Everything that the earth would need to sustain life and provide for mankind. Every single form of vegetation is formed, again, out of the same 17 elements that Chris poured into that container. Just, it's the same thing. Oh, and by the way, it's the same elements in you. So we're all a bunch of dirt clods. But with plant life, see, plant life is a little different now than the other things. With plant life, God had to introduce information. See, you can have time and you can have space and you can have matter, but if you don't have information, you don't got nothing. And so God is now introducing DNA that's required for all this to happen. And it's very important to notice where life begins or comes from. Look at verse 11 again. Then God said, let the earth bring forth. Then on the earth. And again, verse 12. And the earth brought forth. Well, what's the big deal? Because an evolutionist tells you everything crawled out of the ocean. It didn't happen that way. It didn't happen that way. The earth brought forth life. And here life began with grasses, with shrubs, with trees, and all of them mature, able to reproduce on the first day. And it had to be this way. It couldn't be any other way. See, all of these plants and trees are dependent on bees, birds, insects, and other animals for pollination and to propagate. And if evolution is true, then plants would have died a long time before anything crawled out of the pond scum to pollinate and help it plant and life and propagate. So it had to be this way. God, again, created an integrated biological system, completely and 100% interdependent on each other to survive. And he says it's all according to its kind. If there was any place where you could document evolution, it would be right here. Every year, did anybody ever grow, anyone grow up on a farm or a farming community? Anyone, a few of you? Okay, then, then, you, then, you, then I, what I say to you, you go, yeah. Every year, farmers plant billions and billions of wheat seed. And you know what comes up out of the ground? 
wheat. They've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. And nothing except for wheat has been produced. See, if there was evolution, this is where you'd be able to see it as in the plant life. See, this is where we see DNA introduced and the probability of forming a single protein. Uh, this, this is going to seem boring to you guys. So you can go to sleep and this is just for me here. The, the DNA that's introduced and the probability of forming a single protein molecule by chance is impossible. And if you don't believe me, French scientist Lacombe de Nouveau said it is 1 in 10 to the 243rd power. That's a big number. Swift math, uh, the Swiss mathematician Charles A. Go, he calculated out to be 1 in 10 to the 160th power. Using a computer to calculate the same data and problems, Dr. Murphy Eaton of MIT and Dr. Marcel Strasberg of the University of Paris both concluded that evolution is impossible. Why? Because the DNA needed to produce plant life is so unimaginably complex. It's so complex, it can't come out of chance. See, the laws of entropy say everything is breaking down. But as we go through Genesis, what we see is that everything is getting more complex. So did the Lord create trees with tree rings on them? I don't know. I don't care. I believe God created mature plants that were able to propagate. Adam, on day one, first and foremost, he didn't have a belly button, because that's a scar. He was created as a mature man. And I wish more adults would be, what, mature. What God is doing, he's creating a functioning system that's interdependent. All of them reproducing after their kind. Now, you may not have known this, but frozen in Siberia, they found a 90-foot fruit tree frozen in Siberia. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of what they're finding in all these frozen tundras. And it all brings back to the truth that God's word is true. It's reliable. You can trust it. In verse 14, he says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Notice he says that the lights are for signs and seasons. That means it's not for God. God is in eternity. There is no time. There is no seasons. And trust me, God doesn't need a sign to know he exists. We do. So all that he created is for a sign. And that's the whole idea. And it's for seasons, days, years. Something that points to God the creator so that we would glorify him. In verse 16, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. I, I really love this verse, and here's the reason why. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the day. And oh, by the way, the stars. It's like, oh, almost forgot. So the greater light we know is the sun. The lesser light is the moon, and the moon is only a light because it reflects the greater light, the sun. And oh yeah, trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of stars. We don't even know how many stars there are. In verse 17, God set them in the firmament, the expanse of the heaven, to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night. And to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So evening and morning were the fourth day. 
Now, back in verse 3, we read that God said, let there be light. The, the word there is or in the Hebrew, it's spelled O-W-R, but it's or, and it means absolute light. Here in verse 14, the word for light in the Hebrew is ma'or, and that means illuminaries. There it is. Oh, it messed up. I didn't go in and fix the Hebrew. It just always messes up from my computer. Ah, it's Microsoft. They're a bunch of evolutionists. Hey, it's true. Come on. <laughs> but anyways, it means illuminaries, lamps, light bearers. So on the first day, God created light. And on the fourth day, God created the light bulbs. That's the idea here. A daylight bulb is the sun. A mood setting light bulb is called the moon. Doesn't the moon do that? Doesn't it set kind of the mood? It's like, it always reminds me of, you know, when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. Yeah, you know, it's, and so it's the moon. And, and of course, God put in the heavens a bunch of really cool twinkly lights. And he called the stars and the galaxies to mark off time and seasons. Um, I've heard of seasons. I haven't seen one since I moved here. <laughs> Now, here's something that should blow your mind. Scientists, evolutionists, evolutionist scientists, have calculated that in the, in the Milky Way galaxy, which is where we are, does everybody know that? Not like a Milky Way candy bar, but in the Milky Way galaxy, where we are, we are perfectly situated in that mass to be able to see everything else of all the universes and galaxies. Only planet like that. We have no, nothing obstructing us from seeing everything. It, it's literally Earth is the best place to view all the galaxies to see everything in the universe. We have an unobstructed view of it all. Only the Earth can claim that. Look at our moon. Take our moon. It was full yesterday, right? I don't know if it's full today, but it was full yesterday. It's 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's way bigger than a planet our size should have. It is so that scientists at MIT say it's easier to explain why the moon shouldn't be here than to explain why it is here. It doesn't make any sense. That's called a sign. The moon helps control the rotation of the planet on its axis. It helps control our tides, and it controls all the crazy people when it's full. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know if you guys know anybody like that. We are the only planet in the solar system. Because the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, and because of its exact distance from our planet in between the sun, we're the only planet that produces a solar eclipse. The only one. And that allows scientists to view the light spectrum that comes off the edges. And so now scientists realize that our planet is the only planet with the right location that gives them or us all the different light spectrums of all the different colors that hit out from these things. We're the only ones. And science, scientists, these are evolutionists, scientists say for that to happen, it's a trillionth of a trillionth percent that that could happen. Think about that. One trillionth of one trillionth of a percent. That's called a sign. Why has God put us in this location? So that we can observe. We can observe. And then in our observation, we, like David, should be able to, as he says in Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. 
See, God put us exactly where we are so that we can see everything and give him glory. And, and, the, and the, the more we technologically grow, the more we're seeing, the more we realize, wow, our God is great. Amen. See, true science, true science glorifies God. Evolution, or what I call evolution, is nothing more than a lie so that man can glorify himself. The universe is geocentric to God, and God made everything for you. Why didn't God make the lights before the plants? I don't know. You can ask him when you see it. I don't know. But in verse 20, we read, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance. It, literally, it says, let the waters swarm. Let the waters swarm with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament, that expanse of heaven. So God created great sea creatures, wells, and every living thing that moves with which the water abounded according to its kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were day five. See, God says, let he says, the day begins, he says, let the water swarm with living creatures. And he's speaking of both what's in the water and in the air. In verse 21, it says, so God created, you can underline that word created, great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, every winged bird according to its kind. See, we have seen, been seeing God say, let us form, but this is the same word we see in verse 1. Let, it's bara. So something from nothing. He did it on day 1, and here he's doing it on day 5. We have the same word used. God created out of nothing all the marine life and all the androthomic vertebrae animals, also called birds. But unlike plants and planets, here God creates animals with a consciousness. So a lot of people say, well, plants feel. No, they don't. They don't have a consciousness. They're never contemplating anything. They don't know it's, it doesn't know it's alive. It doesn't know when it's dead. It doesn't know when you've eaten it. Okay? See that word, and you can circle it, living creatures there in verse 20. It literally is in the Hebrew, living souls. And the idea is a personality, a consciousness. Animals are conscious living beings. My dog has a conscience. I don't know what it's conscious of. But every single person pet or animal is different than a tree or a tomato plant in your backyard, period. Listen, you can look in the eyes of a cow, and I know you won't see that a cow is conscious. <laughs> you look in their eye and it's like, Arr. but listen, they know when they're hungry. They absolutely know when they're hungry. They know when they have to go potty and all so on. They know these things. A plant is just a body. Animals are both body and soul. And human beings, for that matter, are body, soul, and spirit. Now, they say that there are just over 11 million species of animals on the planet today. But there may have been more at the beginning. We don't know. I don't know. Does anybody know? Was anybody there? Nobody was there at the beginning? Good. <laughs> and if, if we were, would we actually count them? Could you imagine that? 10,221. And then somebody comes up behind you and says, three, four, seven, eight, nine. Oh, I lost my spot. 
They say that there are 8,600 species of birds. They have crossbred them. But guess what? Out of every egg, do you know what comes out? A bird or your breakfast. <laughs> it's true. Who, I, I love eggs. Anybody like eggs? I love eggs. Over easy. Boom. Okay. Now, funny that God created whales before cows, isn't it? Did you see that? God created whales before cows. Now, why is that funny? Because if you speak to an evolutionist, they say that whales have these bumps on their back because they used to be cows or elephants, but changed their mind and went back into the water. It's documented. But here God says, no, no, whales came before cows. Now, that word whale, and you can circle it, is tannin in the Hebrew, and it's also translated in other places in the Old Testament as dragons, sea monsters, and serpents, as well as whales. Which, based on this, means dinosaurs are not millions of years old. Well, how can you say that? Because God created dragons, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are, are 6,000 years old like anything else. Well, how can you say that? Well, understand, because of the vapor canopy blocking out all the harmful radiation and rays, it created what we call a greenhouse effect. In fact, what it did is it created what is known as a harbolic chamber, which has very high oxygen pressure that saturates the body and with a high atmospheric pressure, you have pure oxygen levels. Both plants, animals, and humans would grow larger and live longer. Has anybody seen a fossilized dinosaur egg? Anybody ever seen that? They're, they're like this big. You guys seen that? They're like this big. Do you know it's the same size as an ostrich egg today? Do you know that? Yeah. Absolutely. But reptiles, and, and this is true today, reptiles never stop growing, ever. So with the high oxygen saturation protected from the harmful rays, they would grow faster and bigger, a lot bigger, and never stop growing. Did you guys know that your soft tissue, the soft tissue of human beings, uh, never stops growing? It continues to grow. Could you imagine how big your earlobes and your nose would be if you lived to be 900 years old? I'm serious. You know, take a, take a look at your, at right now, take, take a picture, look at your earlobes, measure them, because in 30 years, they're going to be lower and your nose is going to be bigger because your soft tissue grows. It's the bones and stuff that don't grow. Why do you think, you know, the, you get kind of saggy skin because it keeps growing. Now, if you understand that there was no death until Adam and Eve sinned, and if you reverse the high atmospheric pressure and the oxygen levels, which would have happened at the time of the flood, then reptiles would stop growing at the same rate and wouldn't live as long, which means there may be some dinosaurs among us today, just real small, a lot smaller. When me and my wife went on our honeymoon, we were kind of going through this kind of jungle area, and this lizard, you remember that, honey? This lizard went up on its legs, stood up, and it had these wings that went on the thing, and I immediately thought, oh, it's Jurassic Park. And then I look at this thing and, I, and I, I have all this stuff in my head and I'm thinking, boy, I wonder how big that thing would have got back then. And it's like, it would have been huge. You have Kimona dragons. Times 100. <laughs> you know, as far as their size. Dinosaurs, I believe, are among us today, only a lot, lot, lot smaller. 
All of these species all show up about the same time because they're all interdependent, which is exactly how God created them. Now, if you're still hanging on to evolution, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. I have a picture here. He's called the duck-billed platypus. It isn't a duck. It isn't an otter. It isn't a beaver. But it lays eggs. Do you know that? It does. It lays eggs. It has webbed toes, but four feet and really sharp claws on them. When it hunts, it swims underwater, it closes its eyes and its ears, and it hunts with this sonar that is so sophisticated and so sensitive, it can sense the nervous system of a worm in mud and immediately know where to go and borrow it out. We have nothing close to the sonar that this thing possesses, nothing. It's an amazing thing, it's just kind of weird look at. Now the babies are hatched and they're hatched with teeth that fall out as they get older and then it basically has these little ridges. It defies logic and all evolution because evolution says it should not exist. How about the seahorse? Talking about something that got confused this is a fish that swims upright. And, and FYI, the male seahorses take care of the eggs and hatch them and raise the, the younger ones. They take care of the house. <laughs> How did it evolve? How did that evolve? Again, evolution says there's no way this should exist. The sperm whale. The sperm whale dives over 7,000 feet and stays there for two hours and sometimes longer. Now at that depth, just so you understand, there's over 600,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. That evolved? I don't think so. I'd be more of a shallows kind of guy by this time. Here's another one. Bats and moths. Bats and moths. Bats use sonar to go after moths, but moths sense the sonar, and when the bat gets just about to the right distance, the moth pulls in its wings, drops, so the bat misses them, because the moth has anti-radar. So you have radar and anti-radar. That, that, that evolved? I mean, one more, I can't help myself. I could keep going for weeks. Termites. Termites, ooh, there they are. Termites eat wood. Anybody ever have any termites? They eat wood, but they can't digest the wood. So they have bacteria in their intestines that break down the cellulose. The termite cannot live without the bacteria and the bacteria cannot live in anything else except the termites' intestines. It cannot be introduced into anything else. If you introduce it into anything else, it dies. That evolved? Okay, I, one more. I, I, listen. <laughs> Let me introduce you to the golden pover. It's a small bird. It summers in Canada and parts of Alaska. When they lay their eggs, right after they hatch, they leave for Hawaii. They, 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 yeah, you know, they winter in Hawaii. I mean, it's a tough life, right? <laughs> it stays in Canada until it gains 70 grams of fat. The flight to Hawaii is an 88-hour flight. Must be Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the problem 70 grams of fat 88 hour of flight and these birds burn one gram of fat per hour which makes the trip impossible they would run out of gas except except without being trained without being told 
they take turns with one bird in the front and then they go form a V shape. Do you ever notice why birds have that V shape? Because the one in front basically allows the others to draft and they use less fat. In fact, it's a little over 10% less, less fat and they rotate so they have just enough to make it to Hawaii for dinner. Luau, baby. <laughs> Now, what's remarkable about this isn't that they do that. What's truly remarkable is their offspring, these hatchlings, wait at least two weeks before they leave. Mom and dad are gone for over two weeks. And these little hatchlings that have never been off the reservation, who have never been Hawaii, they get there for the first try every time. Now, you have to understand, if they were just a half a degree off, they'd be 500 miles off course one way or another. But they've never been told where it is. Mom and dad didn't leave a note or a map or anything else. That evolved? I don't think so. See, modern microbiology has revealed that even the simplest organisms are complex machines beyond our wildest imaginations that it would be impossible for them to evolve. Now, let, let's get back to verse 24 as we finish up. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind, cattle, yes, steak, and creeping things. Now, now have you ever wondered where all the creeps in the world were, were made? It's right here, and creeping things. This is where they were created. And the beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Living creatures, again, here are animals with a consciousness. Um, cattle re refers to... Uh, Herbivorous domestic livestock. So you have lambs, so lamb chops. You have pigs, bacon. You have cattle, ribeye. Anybody else hungry? <laughs> you have all these things. Uh, um, and, and creeping things are all the reptiles, insects, and worms. And the beasts are wild animals like lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my! Now, just so you know, wild animals were never designed to be de domesticated. So the people that have tigers at home are idiots. I hope that I'm not, I didn't want to offend anybody here. Does anybody have a, 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 a tiger at home? Good. Does anybody have a monkey at home? It's a wild animal and people do this. And you know that monkeys are actually known to rip people's faces off? Why would you want that at home? I'm sorry. The only thing I want at home is a picture of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> the giraffe. It's a wild animal. I just have to go here. I'm sorry. I'm a glutton for punishment, and I'm punishing you, I know. The giraffe can stand as tall as 19 feet. 19 feet. They weigh about 2,500 pounds. They can run at 36 miles per hour. They eat 201 pounds of food every day. Sixteen to twenty hours a day. That's life. It sleeps about 20 minutes a day, and it can go without water for months at a time. Here's what's amazing. I know you're probably thinking, isn't this like Nat Geo? Oh, no, this isn't because this is all about God. The heart of a giraffe is over two foot long. Over two foot long. That's incredible. But you see, it would have to be that way. It would have to be designed that way because, listen, 
And a lot of people think that giraffes are always eating up, but that's not really true in the wild. They're actually eating down and up and drinking. If you heard a lion, actually there was a picture of three lions attacking one giraffe. It wasn't a pretty picture. Um, they're jumping up on its neck and everything. But if you're 19 feet long with that neck and you lean down to eat something and then you hear a wild animal and you lift up your head and you don't get enough blood or oxygen to your brain, do you know what happens? You pass out. Absolutely you pass out. But see, God created this. God created. Listen, the DNA inside of a single cell bacteria is so complex, the information of the DNA would fill 100,000 pages of a single cell bacteria. 100,000 pages. Now think about the human DNA, which is the most complex thing in the world. See, God created with such complexity and diversity, and he did so because it's a sign. It all points back to a great creator, a God in heaven that loves you. And he didn't create any of this for himself. No, no, no. He didn't create anything of this stuff for himself. He created it all for you. You who is the object of his love and affection. And when I think about that, all I can say is amen. Amen? amen. Well, Father in heaven, we rejoice and thank you for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, we thank you that truly, not only the heavens and earth declare your glory, but, but Lord, just the simplest life forms are so complex that there is absolutely no way that they could have evolved. So Lord, help us to trust your word. Because, Lord, if we can believe in the beginning God, then everything else is simple. If we can believe that, then resurrection is nothing. If we can believe that, then just as he was resurrected, so will we be who trust in him. So, Lord, according to your spirit, just seal this in our hearts and in our minds that we would trust the God who created us, and who loves us so much. So pour out your spirit upon us, I pray in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that, church, you'll say, Amen. Amen.